tonight, Donald Trump is calling for competition, not protectionism, in the race to roll out the next generation of wireless technology. The president's hard line on Huawei's 5G technology seems to be softening. The president alluded to Huawei when he tweeted earlier, I want 5G and even 6G technology in the United States as soon as possible. American companies must step up their efforts to get left or get left behind. And this is the bit. I want the US to win through competition, not by blocking out currently more advanced technologies. Now, this is a very interesting uh, tweet, and it tells an interesting story. Mr. Trump's fears about falling behind in the 5G race, regardless of whether you stop Huawei by blocking it, seems to be well founded. Here's a list of the top five patent holders of 5G technology. And you've got, <coughs> excuse me, Samsung South Korea at the top number of patents, more than 12,000. You've got big hitters from China, South Korea, and Europe. Huawei. Ericsson, of course, is Sweden, ZTE from China. But the only bigger uh, American player is Qualcomm. And Qualcomm is currently being sued in the United States by the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, over antitrust issues concerning a merger. Shirley Palmer is CEO of the Palmer Group. Always helps us understand what's happening with this issue. Good to see you, nice as always, Shirley. Um, firstly, the, the president's call when he says we should compete instead of blocking. We must get, the U.S. must get its own expertise and world leading in 5 and 6G. He's right. Well... <clears throat> You can say that so much more easily than you can actually do it. What's the policy or what are the government policies that will enable that? In China, the reason they're far ahead and the reason that South Korea is far ahead is that the governments of those countries have gotten seriously behind the technology. They have cleared the way for the towers to be built and placed and financed. And they are looking at their roads and they're looking at their infrastructure and the new infrastructure they're building is 5G compatible or ready to be 5G compatible. <laughs> and so we don't have any of those policies in place. If I needed right now to put up all the towers I need in the island of Manhattan, I would have uh, years of legal battles ahead of me to, as I try to put them okay, but uh, that where doesn't, they need to go. That, that's the execution of the operations of it. But that doesn't explain the lack of R&D. I don't think you know, that's the a, issue. A Lucent, look, let's remember Lucent. Let's just pour yeah, old Lucent. Yeah, yeah. It, gets, it, it was a great... It gets, Back in the day. Go, gets lost, it gets spun off from AT&T, yeah. parent company of yeah. the network. It's then split. Mm -hmm. It then goes to Alcatel. Yep. It's, a, it's, a, it's nowhere near the old Bell Labs, which led the way. Yeah. There's no question you are correct, but R&D comes in a lot of flavors, and the innovation we're talking about, 5G is a standard, it's a technical specification, a bunch of engineers got to have to get together and agree, and once they agree, then it's continuous innovation and continuous improvement, and I'm, I'm sorry to disagree with the president, we can compete, yes, China's ahead, yes, South Korea's ahead, many countries could be ahead. You say you can't. We, we, we can compete. But... No, the but is we need government policies that will allow the technology to become adopted because in our capitalist system, we need to put it out there to pay right, for but, putting it out there. Right, but then you've got Qualcomm, for example, which is the only near competitor yeah. uh, that Qualcomm has. And that is enmeshed, of course, still trying to deal with its uh, merger issues uh, with the FTC. That's, a, that's exactly right. Look, at the end of the day, I, I, once again, I said this is more of a policy problem than it is a technology <laughs> problem. From a technology, it, Richard, I have to tell you, in the United States, you never count us out technologically. There just aren't, um, it's not one place in the world things get done. But we need to set up a culture and we need to set up a political so, climate where we can actually innovate. So if you take the starting point as the president's tweet, mm -hmm. what has to flow out? Well, the first thing I'd want to see from the government, if you're going to make that statement, then tell me what you're going to do, government, to pave the road for us. I want to use CV to X, cellular vehicle to everything communication over 5G unlicensed. I want all the, Ford's already announced they want to do it. So will the highways talk? to the cars? Will the street signs talk to the cars? Will the buildings talk to the cars? Where will the towers go? Where will the sensors go? How are we going to plan our infrastructure in the United States so that we can take full advantage of the, of the amazing capacity of 5G, both from bandwidth and from the very short latency that, that allows us to do a lot of computing is, external to our devices? Is Huawei the menace that the, the, the vice president and the administration says it is. So 
I, you ask five people, you're going to get five answers. We, we, meaning we, the large we, do not trust Huawei because they, people feel, the, the argument is, that it's an agent of the Chinese government and that the Chinese government wants to spy on us and therefore they will use that technology to do it. It's a valid, logical argument. Whether it's true or not, that I do not know. And I don't, It's a trust issue, though, isn't it? It's purely trust. And it's a trust, and then, uh, the, but the British say... Uh, trust and verify, or to paraphrase, and they describe it as a manageable risk. It's not a manageable risk. If you believe that bad things will happen, um, it's nothing will prevent that. You have to trust your partners, and if the partner's trustable, you're good. You're not going anywhere. Okay. I mean, uh, don't tell me that. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> I just mean, for the next few minutes, stay where you are. We'll be back with you later in the program. AT&T, our parent company, has a message for Google's YouTube. It says it's pulling all of its advertising from YouTube over inappropriate content that's raising child exploitation fears. And it's not alone. The branding expert, Bruce Cattell, of uh, Chief Executive of Turkel Brands, joins me live from Miami. And Shelley Palmer is here again. Uh, Bruce, essentially, this is about innocent posts on YouTube of things like uh, young females doing gymnastics and then unsavory, arguably pedophilic, comments attached to it and corporate advertisers ar uh, around it. Um, YouTube is saying it's looking what it can do. If you're a big brand, what do you do about this? If you're a big brand, you do exactly what those brands did. You run for the hills. Richard, here's a new term. You're going to hear it here first, but you're going to hear it a lot in the next few years. Adjacency awareness. It no longer is good enough to run ads where you think people are watching. You have to know what's around them. Because, let's face it, nobody knew what was there. It's algorithms that pick where the ads run. But the, uh, the uh, activists, the objectors, they use the same right. algorithms, we call it Google, to find where these ads are. But this is slightly different in the sense that in the past, this adjacent awareness has been the adverts themselves. Here, it's user-created content where, which is entirely innocent and wholesome, where contributors, you know, members of the public, nasties, have added unsavory, vile con uh, comments. My friend, I respect that because you're in the industry. You know everything about media. It's what you do every day. But consumers don't. And although that's a very logical argument, it's not an emotional argument. And the consumers don't think about that. Nobody thinks that these companies condone that kind of activity, and nobody thinks YouTube condones that kind of activity. No longer matters. Today, inaction equals endorsement, because someone sees it, and the knee-jerk reaction is the ad is next to that horrible comment, I'm not doing business with that company anymore. That's the way consumers act. So. Brand safety. We'll talk about that. It's content adjacency and brand safety are not new concepts. Here's the problem YouTube is having. You've described it perfectly. These are videos of young children doing whatever young children right. do, and pedophiles writing in code are communicating with each other internally, and that community is leveraging a very wholesome environment but to do really bad stuff. But is it possible? For YouTube, yes, is it possible yes. technologically? No, it doesn't. It's not a technological thing at all, because you don't need that. It's called human curation. You have a content and community manager who manages a community, and you step it up YouTube, and you step it up Facebook, and you take responsibility for what's on your platform. All right, but Bruce Shelley is absolutely right. But Bruce, will that be enough for companies? I mean, at the yes, end of the that day, that would be enough. E well, yeah, at the end of the day, even with human curation you're still going to have these incidents happening because algorithms are so powerful. What do companies do, Bruce? What the companies have to do is exactly what Shelley said. They have to be aware of everywhere their message is because, once again, adjacency awareness says you are going to be blamed for whatever you're next to. And you can like it or dislike it. You can say it's fair or unfair. But at the end of the day, none of that matters. What matters is that you don't want your brand next to something that people find distasteful. We'll, we'll come to judge. Bruce, staying with you, though, surely, I mean, does it really affect the companies, I suppose, in the case of something as vile as this. But in, in the case of Bruce, in case of just nudity or something that, like, I mean, you know, do, do, do users really associate the two? Uh, I, I'll take that right now. I'll just say to you, 
Either advertising works or it doesn't. Either messaging works or it doesn't. You can't have it both ways. If you are adjacent to something that is not on brand for you and you're a marketer, then your message is compromised and you unfortunately are not going to get the efficacy out of your brand dollars that you want. You also, if you're a publicly traded company, you've got the public screaming and yelling at you. It's like, okay, look what so, you've done. So let's go back to what YouTube can actually do. All right? Yeah. So in the scenario, you've got YouTube that is, it has it has its content, which is automatically putting, um, which is automatically putting comments, yes. and it's automatically putting. Uh, well, no, let's let's talk. Let's talk about the technology right straight up. A video goes on YouTube. And it's got a comment section, which the author of the video, and it's user-generated video generally, though companies put up videos and people put up videos, you can either enable or disable comments. If you enable comments, they're open. Now, you can go in and, and edit them yourselves. YouTube does not touch your comments. They don't do it. But is it realistic? Is it realistic to do that, bearing in mind the size and scale YouTube is the largest you purveyor uh, Richard, of video content. So we now come to the major question of, of the 21st century. Right. The actual major question, which is what is real and what is fake? What are we responsible for and what are we not responsible for? Technology will, uh, look, we can write these posts by computer. We don't, uh, AI can write the post. You don't even need people to do the comment. The question is, if there was a community manager there, right. Then the community manager will be able to go, hey, this is not appropriate for this environment. Stay with me. And Bruce, you're back. Uh, I believe we had a yes. technical problem. But listen, before we come to you finally, Bruce, I want to read this story first. Nike shares were down 1.5% after a very high-profile sneaker malfunction. The college basketball star, Zion Williamson, got injured after his sneaker shoe tore apart at the start of a big game on Wednesday night. Now, Williamson's meant to be the next big NBA star. Look at that shoe. Nike said it's working to identify the issue. You are our branding expert on Quest Means Business, uh, Bruce. I mean, if you are Nike, this has gone around the world. What do you do? I start marketing him. I start talking about how strong he is, how powerful he is. I design a new shoe with steel cables to keep him in. I turn this liability into an asset that we are going to have the shoe for the strongest guy in the world, and we turn that into the shoe that everybody wants. Yeah, I'd handle that differently. <laughs> good to see you. Thanks, Shelley. Good to see you. Good to see you, Bruce. Thank you very much. Good to see you, Shelley. Always good to have you. Always good to have you, Bruce, as well.